I'm Scott. And I'm Melissa. And we are the Sunshine Travelers. Our passion is travel and sharing our experiences with those that enjoy it as much as we do, those that want to learn more about travel, or even those that just want to live vicariously through our travel stories. No matter where you fall along that journey, get ready to hear about our firsthand experiences as we visit some of the most interesting and amazing places on earth. This episode, we continue our Recorded on Site series as we discover St. John Island in the U.S. Virgin Islands. No need for a passport this week, as St. John is another U.S. territory. We will talk about where to stay on the island, where to eat, and what to do, along with conversations that we've had over the last few days. So pack a bag and come join us on St. John Island. So Melissa, uh, let's start off with where do you stay on St. John? We have always stayed, well, so this is our second trip. And so we have stayed at the Weston St. John uh, both times. So the Weston is located in its own little bay called Great Cruise Bay, not to be confused with the, the Cruise Bay, which is sort of the main town on St. John. And the main ferry from St. Thomas goes into Cruise Bay. So in Cruise Bay, that's where you're going to find most of your restaurants and things like that. So there is one main resort in Cruise Bay called Gallows Point Resort. Uh, It is a three-star resort and it's right there at the ferry terminal. So that might be a convenient location, um, just getting off the ferry and having that there. Um, So for the Westin, though, they do provide a separate shuttle from St. Thomas um, if you're going to stay at the Westin. So some people might have heard of or be familiar with Keneal Bay Resort, uh, which actually was operated as part of the national park um, on on concession with another vendor, but they have not opened or reopened since the hurricane. And um, that's something that we probably do need to mention here too, is that St. John has had a recovery from... Maria in 2017 Um, and so it's taken a long road um, of recovery for the hurricane and then also the pandemic and just getting people back to traveling and then I mean St. John is is pretty remote as far as getting not only getting supplies here but then just also it's very mountainous and so if roads were washed out and power was out I think for at least eight months Um, here and so just that um, those two things have just made it very difficult Um, so that Keneal Bay Resort did not open back up and And I heard someone um, in the resort the other day talking about Keneal Bay and they were saying that they haven't done anything with it since the hurricane and matter of fact if you go over there you'll see that it's kind of grown over and they said it's kind of like Jurassic Park where the nature has begun to to reclaim that area. And we'll talk in a second with about what to do. We'll talk in a second about what they are actually doing with that um, as of right now. Um, and so I think a lot of people, if you stay on this side of the island, so this is the Cruise Bay, Great Cruise Bay, um, with the ferry terminal, a lot of people rent um, Airbnbs and stay in houses, um, rent cars, stay in houses, have some amenities like being able to to cook, which is what we have, is we have a villa at the at the Westin, but being able to cook and then also probably having things at their villa like beach chairs and things like that. And then let's also mention that there's a whole nother side of the island called Coral Bay. So if you are staying over there, you probably are definitely going to want to rent a car Um, I mean, you could have a taxi over there, but then you'd really, it would be a long way for you to be going back and forth. Um, So there are some Airbnbs and some eco resorts and stuff like that on that side. So we'll link a few things in the show notes just to kind of give you a feel and separate those out between the two um, locations. But just be aware when you're looking at accommodations um, that the Cruise Bay side and the Coral Bay side, 30 to 40 minutes driving time. And so it's it's quite remote um, over there. Very steep roads that wind back and forth and have lots of cutbacks and so it's you know it's a doable drive but it's not an easy drive and just as a reminder when you're here on St. John Island uh, you are driving on the left hand side of the road 
everything else is the same. The steering wheel's on the left side of the car. You're just driving on the left side of the road. And talking about Airbnbs, um, you know, the Westin is a fairly large sized resort here, but obviously it can't uh, accommodate all of the people who visit this island. So, you know, there must be a pretty large Airbnb business here. Yes, and just just glancing through on a couple of things with um, in, on Booking.com, and uh, I saw just a lot of accommodations that pop up, just since there aren't many r- hotels and resorts. Um, a lot of accommodations pop up um, that are Airbnbs. And I would also say just be aware that when booking, make sure that it is – on St. John, if that's what you're looking for, because a lot of times it'll show you places nearby. And so you can actually see St. Thomas across the bay. And so make sure it's not switching over there. If you intend to book something on St. John, that it's not showing that um, as well. So that is an important distinction because it is close by. And you mentioned a little while ago, the uh, eco lodges. We saw at least one of those today up on the side of a mountain, you know, these um, look like you know, maybe one bedroom type lodges, things like that with the porch that overlook the the bay. And so, I mean, I imagine those are fairly nice, you know, from perspective, but there is something to know about eco lodges, right? Yeah. So typically those are going to be fueled by um, solar power. We've stayed at one in Costa Rica, so it's going to be fueled, fueled by solar power. The water is typically heated by the sun. And so once you use your hot water, um, there's not going to be probably Wi-Fi and things like that. So typically, so I'll look and do some research on those, um, just because we did just run across that today and see uh, what those what those options are. And I can link some of those in the show notes as well. Yeah, you know, Saint John is a fairly small island. You can get across it in less than an hour. And so, you know, what are the things to do here in Saint John? So first of all, you do want to make sure that you get out and see the island, that you don't just stay at your resort or stay in town or stay at your Airbnb. Let's back up a second. 60% of the island is actually within the Virgin Islands National Park. So 60% of the island. And so all of those beaches actually belong inside the National Park. Some of the most beautiful beaches, I would say, in the world, wouldn't you, Scott? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, White sand. So if you like white sand beaches, that's what they are. The clearest water. I mean, forget the pool. Like you get into the water here and the water is just as crystal clear as pool water. Yes, just absolutely beautiful. And we should also point out that their high season here is actually going to be in the winter time. So November through March-ish is going to be their absolute peak season. Well, so after hurricane season, so probably December through march is going to be their absolute peak season. We have actually been, this is our second trip, both times in May, and we have had fantastic weather. I mean, it's been warm and humid, but we've had fantastic weather. And so, and then it's starting to go into the, to the lower season. So June and July, um, it's going to be their off peak season. And then starting September, October, you do have to watch out for hurricanes and have just have the possibility that a hurricane could yeah, be coming through. The possibility that it could. Yes. Absolutely. Not that it definitely will. Yes. And a little while ago, we were talking about renting a car while here in St. John and there's one particular car that seems to be the most rented. Yeah, so it looks like a Jeep convention in any parking lot um, that you go. Now, I, I think that that is mainly because just it's fun to drive a Jeep around the island, let the wind is down, let the breeze throw through your hair, because I, from what I understand, there's really only one place, which is Lameshire Bay, which you really need a four-wheel drive to get yeah. down, and that's on the absolute opposite end of the island on past uh, Coral Bay, past where you go to Ram's Head, and then you keep going. Um, and that's really the only one. But, yes, Jeeps tend to be the very popular vehicle to rent. Here. And it's not because you can let the top down because in most of the rental places, they tell you not to remove the top. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and you have to sign something, not remove the top. But you can let the let the windows down and let the breeze. Um, yeah. I mean, it's fun to drive. Um I will never turn down the opportunity to drive around in a Jeep. But if you want to do something maybe a little more economical, 
there may be some other options uh, for rental other than a Jeep. Jeep wasn't bad. Um, I think, you know, we rented a four door for $80 a day. That was a hunk of junk that we got the first one. We took it back. All they had was a two door Jeep. It was less of a hunk of a junk. I think it was $70 a day. So they refunded us the, you know, $10 per day for doing that. But I imagine you could probably find a, you know, a small car or something like that that you could rent for, for less than that price. Less, yes. So I think at the Westin, um, they actually have on-site rentals. And I'm not really sure why we didn't do this. I guess I didn't research it well enough. But on-site rentals from an O'Connor um, car, car rental that you can actually pick up here at the resort. Um, there's a few other ones courtesy St. John Rental, so I can link some of those in the yeah. show notes too. And all of those that we saw, because they usually have some kind of sticker on the on the car, all of those seem to be uh, very nice in good condition. I, we had rented from this place before, and I thought we did fine um, when we rented previously. This time, not so much luck. We've done two different cars. The first one, we just it was an absolute piece of junk, and we took it back. The second one, it sounds like a machine gun when you first start it up. And so um, anyhow, but once that gets past, it, it drives fine. Don't worry about the smoke coming out of the <laughs> engine compartment. It's okay. The lights, don't worry about them. They're, it's all okay. Travel stories, travel memories. That's what we have from this. So um, in our opinion, it is best if you rent a car or a Jeep on St. John. Um, you can get around uh, by the taxis. Um, but if you're going to do this for several days, it's going to get quite expensive. Well, and so, Scott, let's, let's explain explain <laughs> yeah. what the taxis are here. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're not talking black cab, um, and we're not talking about a yellow taxi, uh, and it's definitely not Uber. So this is a pickup truck that has a, oh, it's, it's like a, it's a covered wagon <laughs> on the back of the pickup truck bed. Um, that's the best way that I can explain it. Um, maybe if you think about if you went to, you know, Callaway Gardens or somewhere like that, and you got on a tram, and the tram has the bench rows or whatever, and they're enclosed. Well, it's like they put a tram on the back of a pickup truck, and that's what you ride in. Or let's say Disney World. A lot of people probably aren't going to know what Callaway Gardens is, <laughs> but the tram on it the uh, yeah, the tram on from Disney World on the back of a pickup truck, and it's not air conditioned. So in the summer, it's going to be hot, and so then if you're going to take that all the way. To the beach, I don't know. For here from the Westin, just to downtown per person, they charge you seven dollars. So I can imagine to all the way to the beaches, back and forth every day if you have a lot of people. So yeah, that would be really expensive. Yeah, and just having to, you know, take all your stuff, and it just would be, and having to wait too. I would think having to wait to go back and forth, and worrying about what time the last one's going to go back. And we just like to have the freedom of um, having our own vehicle. So, but um, I will say, if you want to do that. At all of the beaches up till about five o'clock, we saw as you walked off, there was someone there waiting at all of the main beaches to collect you and to take you back. So it's a possibility. Uh, it's probably just not the easiest way to get around. Yeah, if you're just going to do that once or once or twice. But so we would definitely recommend that you visit these beaches. OK, so, all right. So we have all these beaches. So let's just name some of the, the popular beaches real quick. And so you have Trunk Bay, you have Cinnamon Bay, you have Honeymoon Beach, you have Hawks Nest. And you're going to see those as you as you drive this first little section. And so you're definitely going to want to visit those white sandy beaches. And I mean, they're just absolutely beautiful. So just to give you an idea. And so even if you are staying at the Westin, this great cruise bay, I mean, it looks like a beautiful bay, all these boats, it looks like a beautiful beach and beach chairs. But no, I mean, that's fine. Spend a day there. But make sure that you go see some of these other beaches. Yeah, we talked to someone that works at the Westin. And he mentioned that there was a, a young couple that was staying here. They were on their honeymoon. They had these nice tans. And so he asked them uh, which beaches they had been to. And they said, just the one here at the Westin. I shook my head in you know, disbelief. And he was like, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the same thing I said. The only thing that we could figure is maybe they want to stay close to the room or something. 
So thankfully he informed them about um, to just go see some of the others so that you can see what St. John and see what these beaches are all about. Um, and so the, the second thing is there is actually a lot of hiking here because it is the national park. So there's miles of trails with beautiful vistas. You can stop by the visitor center, which we noticed that they are still definitely renovating um, for additional information on the trails and um, also the beaches. But we do have a tip for you. Do not let those national park rangers talk you into doing the ram's head trail during the full moon at night and saying that it'll be bright enough and you don't need a flashlight yeah we did that on our first trip here um, about nine years ago they had talked about what a great trail it is and the bright moon you know you want it's like being in daylight yeah if you're wearing blinders maybe so, but definitely um, go to Ram's Head. Um, it is a point that just looks out completely to the ocean, no other islands. Um, I think they say from that point, when you look across, it's the next piece of land is Africa um, from there. So definitely go there. Just don't. But you won't, you won't see Africa. Well, no, Let's you won't see Africa. Make sure yeah. everybody knows that. Yeah. And a couple of tips there as well. It is very hot here this time of year. And so I would say don't try to do these trails during the middle of the day. It's just too hot. Make sure to get up, do them first thing in the morning or towards the afternoon, and you'll, you'll appreciate that. Yeah, so a couple of other ones besides that, that Ram's Head um, trail is that you could hike from the visitor center to Solomon Bay. I think it's the only way actually to reach Solomon Bay or then on to Honeymoon Bay as well. So... Um, so definitely check out the beaches. Um, one other point, so you may see Honeymoon Bay. It's a little confusing, the signage, but um, where that Keneal Bay Resort used to be, they're actually operating it, it as a Keneal Bay Beach Club. And so that's kind of the access to Honeymoon Bay. Used to could be you'd go down, down into where that resort was and you could park and you could walk. Um, and so now when you see that entrance, um, you can pay a parking fee, they shuttle you down, they have some amenities, bathrooms and chairs and all kinds of things you can rent. So if you see that Keneal Bay Beach Resort, that takes you to that Honeymoon Bay and the Honeymoon Beach. But what we need to talk about now is what we do when we're on St. John. And what we do when we're here is snorkel. That's right. That's where we spend the majority of our time Matter of fact, over the past few days, we've been hitting three beaches a day for snorkeling. And I think this is the only place that I have ever been where you can you can just snorkel right off the beach. I mean, we've done it some in Hawaii, but I wouldn't say that every beach was like great for snorkeling there. And then other places that we go, you have to go out on a boat for several hours and go to where they take you. But this is really the only place where you are going to see reefs on the side some in the middle and see sea turtles and we've seen rays and so if you like snorkeling this is the place that you need to go so what we're going to yeah. do is like scott said we have hit probably three beaches well we have hit three beaches a day for the past several days and so we're going to tell you the highlights and give you the top five and then where to go on those so um, I'll start with the first one. So Hawk's Nest is really the second beach that you come to. Um, it's the last one that we snorkeled today. The parking is right there and the beach is right there. And we were actually really amazed at the snorkeling there. So there are some reefs right in the middle um, with fantastic um, fish and we saw turtles and we saw rays and then we also snorkeled up the the rocks on the left hand side and what we liked about it was it was actually very calm it's a very protected bay so you're not going to have to worry as much about strong currents um, as some of these other ones we're going to talk about so definitely put hawk's nest on your list for snorkeling yeah and i think i'm going to take some of the videos um, took the new uh, GoPro 11 with this out on the trip um, through all of the bays. Uh, I will say, I, and I write a blog post or update my blog post on this one, but um, I added the red filter to my GoPro and takes totally different looking pictures um, and videos than without it. And that's because the water filters out red light. And so when you add that red filter in, 
it puts some of those colors back in and you're not just looking at green and, and blue water. One of the things I'm considering doing is taking some of these videos and putting them out on YouTube, just concatenate them together. And so if you ever need an opportunity to just have some peaceful moments, uh, you can go out there on that YouTube site that we'll put a link to and watch some of these videos because it is absolutely mesmerizing uh, to watch these fish uh, swimming underwater and uh, some of the sea turtles that we saw and things like that. Yes, yeah, so we'll definitely put a link to that. And it's just so enjoyable just to be floating out there and um, just right off the beach being able to see all these amazing underwater life. Yeah, so uh, definitely uh, hawk's nest being at the top of the list. Yes, and so then um, number two is Water Lemon Key. And so that's Water Lemon Bay and then Water Lemon Key. So for this one, it's going to be a little bit of a hike. It's probably not quite a mile. Um, and so you park where you see... Um, like ruins from an old sugar plantation. And you'll see a parking lot there. And so you park where you see Leinster Bay. Um, and then you just take that trail. So it's a Leinster Bay Trail. And you just take that trail on around. Um, you'll see the bay to your left. You're going to want to circle around the beach um, and then back to your right just a little bit. And you're going to see a rock out in the water. And that's what you're going to want to snorkel around. So now we actually did snorkel. It was pretty calm that day. We actually did snorkel all the way around it. Um, the right-hand side and probably the tip were probably the best. And so I would say if it's pretty rough, um, you might want to circle back around and come back in um, because then when we got all the way around, the current was pretty strong. And so a couple of things there when you're when you're snorkeling out like that, different from hawk's nest when you're snorkeling out like that, make sure that you're always snorkeling with somebody and just really watch those currents um, and make sure that you're a strong swimmer and that if there's any, any sign that that those currents are going to be strong or whatever, just just stay on the yeah. safe side of the rocks and yeah, just turn around because you're going to have plenty of opportunities to snorkel. That that one that one side or whatever is not going to make a difference because when we talk about snorkeling, we're not talking about just you know swimming underwater and looking at rocks underwater. This is like swimming inside of the most amazing. Um, saltwater aquarium that you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, coral formations and just all kinds of colorful fish. I mean, we saw squid. I mean, the sea urchins that you see, just incredible. Yeah, we saw three and a half, four foot tuna. Yes, I mean, tonight. Yeah. Yes. But um, it's it's really amazing. All right, and so then the third one is Trunk Bay, which is probably um, famous for two reasons. It's one of the Caribbean's most beautiful beaches. Um, absolutely gorgeous beach. Now, it can get very crowded very quickly. Um, the parking is a premium, and there's just not a lot of there's not a lot of road parking, as Scott mentioned, because of the windy roads and stuff like that. So get there early or do like we did. We get there. We got there late. People tend to kind of leave these beaches if they've been there all day, like 3, 4 o'clock. Um, so you'll see in Trunk Bay there is a, a, a rock, um, a big rock out to – Kind of the right um, and they have an underwater snorkel path but really don't follow that path um, I mean look at those but they're not taking you really close enough to where the reef is I mean don't get too close and, and like I mentioned before like just be aware but you do want to go a little bit closer to that rock and watch those currents so that can be some really good snorkeling there in Trunk Bay and then just to see that famous beach as well well let's wrap up the the last two real quick all right, so then Cinnamon Bay, kind of the same thing. We snorkeled out to the rock um, and just, again, being aware of the currents, but we saw some really amazing things there. And then if you're in for the turtles, now we saw turtles probably just about everywhere, didn't yeah. we? But Maho Bay is known for the turtles. Um on kind of in the middle and to the left hand side and it's because there's a lot of grassy vegetation um, there and so just watch uh, definitely watch for the turtles kind of on the left hand side if you're facing out yeah. to the water the left hand side of that bay i would say if you're snorkeling and you come across a grassy area underneath start work watching for turtles mm -hmm. and we saw them with like the little um sucker fish little or little sucker fish with them and and fish yeah, cleaning someone them said off nurse and, shark but i i don't know that it is a nurse shark but yeah. it's some kind of sucker fish that just 
um, sits on its shell and cleans off the shell and stuff like that. So an amazing place to see the turtles. Okay, so um, let's move on to now where should you eat on St. John? Yeah, um, and I'm going to say something here, and hopefully this isn't controversial, but uh, if you're a foodie and you're coming to St. John, this may not be your place. You know, there's there's definitely good food uh, to be had here, but I would say that, you know, it is it's probably not known for its restaurants. Definitely agree with that. Um, and I think that's why we have typically enjoyed having a villa and a lot of people stay at Airbnbs. There's a handful of restaurants, um, but a handful of restaurants. And so if you are here for an entire week, you probably are going to have to end up starting to repeat yeah. some places. And- and it's really expensive. It is really expensive. Yeah. And food, I mean, even in the grocery store, and we'll give a couple of suggestions, but even in the grocery store, food's expensive. It's just, like I mentioned before, it's just very difficult to get things here. And so think about the price of food as it has increased. It's even more expensive here. Yeah. And, and selection, you know. So I think that's why you just don't see all these top gourmet restaurants and things like that. There's definitely clientele here um, and people that can uh, afford to eat at them. Um, But I don't know that they necessarily live here year round as well. And so anyhow, um, I would just say uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about where to eat. But I would I would recommend that when you're looking at places to stay, make sure that you have some type of fully functional kitchen. Um, because that's going to be your best bet for eating here on the island, in our opinion. Yes, in our opinion. Definitely agree. Or at least split between. I mean, we've eaten out a a good bit, but it's split between those two things. Um, So the main shopping dining area is just um, a little conglomerate of shops and restaurants called Mongoose Junction. Um, And it is the very furthest, well, it's not far from the ferry terminal. And it's kind of as you go out of town toward uh, the national park, toward the beaches. Um, So there's not a lot of parking there. Um, You can park there if you're a patron of that particular shopping area. There's probably four or five restaurants. Um, That's where you're going to find most of the shopping, too. I mean, there's some jewelry shops and surf and beach type shops and ice cream places and stuff like that. So that's probably going to be um, your best option. Um, if you like breweries, St. John Brewers has a tap room here. They do have um, a restaurant as well, but then that's where they have their brewery. Um, so right across from the ferry terminal is a little uh place called Our Market Smoothies. And so go in there and see our friend Karen. Tell her that Scott and Melissa sent you. And so that's a great place for just afternoon smoothies, ice cream, milkshakes, cocktails. She'll customize anything, uh, make any combination you want and put whatever kind of rum you want in it um, as well. So that's a great place to stop in. Yeah. And they, they do have two locations uh, in town. Um, this one is the one right across from, as Melissa said, right across from the um, cruise terminal. But um Karen's well, the ferry or, terminal or the ferry is not ter- a cruise Sorry. here, but yeah, a ferry yeah. terminal. Yeah, no cruise, no cruise ships coming in here, um, which is a, it's a benefit as well, right? Because you don't have the um, daily onslaught of people coming over on a cruise. You do have a lot of people who will come for the day from uh, St. Thomas, but not like a whole cruise ship dumping off onto the island. But go see Karen. Ask her to fix you a smoothie uh, with some rum in it or one of her cocktails um, and tell her we said hello. So one other location that uh, you could stop in and eat at is called Tap and Still. And we visited their location on St. Thomas in Red Hook before we took the ferry over. Um, It was very good. It's burgers and um, wings and fries and hot dogs. Scott said it was like a local Five Guys. Yeah. Except for the wings. And I thought the wings were very, very good. The only thing that was different on the menu were the wings. Mm -hmm. Um, Otherwise, the way that you order it and the options that you can choose, it's it's 100% of five guys. So, and then as far as shopping, there are a couple of markets now. They're fairly small. Um, and you, you basically get what you get 
um, from what they have. So Starfish Market is closer to end of town. And then there's a place called Dolphin Market that's closer to the Westin. Um, I went in there and it was, they had more options for if you're looking for things that are more like gluten-free and keto and maybe more options that you're used to in the States. Um, I would say that Dolphin Market and it's closer to the Westin, but they both had, you know, what they had. And if they were out of stuff, they were just out of stuff until they get it back in and that's just the way it is so and as Scott mentioned uh, we had a villa with the kitchen we would definitely recommend that um, the, I don't, there's if you were trying to like find coffee shops and breakfast and you're just not going to have a lot of options so we typically fix breakfast fix sandwiches for lunch um, and would split our time between going out and, and fixing at the villa and so just one other thing to mention as Scott was mentioned about taking a day trip here so this is definitely a day trip possibility if you cruise and have a stop over in St. Thomas um, so a lot of operators are gonna probably have day trips that will bring you over here on a boat or you could do a snorkeling trip. Um, we have seen people who had talked about, oh, what what ferry are we catching back to um, St. Thomas? But it's probably best to do some kind of excursion that then gets you back to the boat on time. And um, so looking into those, and I can link some of those options for day trips from St. Thomas as well, um, if you have to be back on the yeah. on a it, cruise ship. It's basically one of those taxis that picks you up at the terminal, the ferry terminal, and then takes you out to whatever bay that you're going to go snorkeling in or a uh, trail that you're going to go hike. Yeah. So that would be a great option. So, I mean, if you have been to St. Thomas before, like on a cruise and then you come on a cruise again to St. Thomas, St. John would be a great option for uh, another way to see this part of the Caribbean. Yeah. And there's, there's another thing that we learned this time um, about the car ferries is that either from St. Thomas to St. John or vice versa, you can actually, you know, rent a car and take the car and go to the other place. Now, I will tell you that there are signs that say you can't take the cars off of the island, but there seems to be a lot of rules that are kind of optional here. Well, and it could be the people that we talked to rented on St. Thomas and then we're bringing it over to St. John. So there may be to like maybe to get that business and have it come over here. Um, there may have been a different rule, but yes, ours had a sign in the car that said, do not, it cannot leave the island. We had a lot of rules that don't seem to be enforced. <laughs> so um, one other resource for you that our taxi driver over that brought us to the Western Ferry mentioned is the St. John app. That would, might be a great resource for you to just have like it has some shopping and some dining and it gives a few little details about the different beaches. We, um, not a lot of detail because it just basically said great for snorkeling on the sides. And so we just kind of had to see, we gave you a list that we felt like was in order of this one's the best, this one's the next best, but the app might be a, a useful, it's a free app. So the St. John app is just, if you, if you look up that on the app store. And one point I'd make on that is the order that we put it in right now may be for this time of year. So if you come and you go to uh, Hawk's Nest Beach and you're not seeing anything, then realize that it could be that at different times of the year, um, the, you know, the fish migrate or, or whatever to, to different areas. I don't think that's going to be so much true maybe for the turtles I think the turtles tend to be more mobile and move around. Um, I think the like the tropical fish, like that's where they're always going to be. So I think that will that will con be a constant. And Scott, we should probably mention that while we have not seen any seaweed on this trip, or really not much seaweed at all on this side of the island, um, we did go over to Salt Pond salt pond today snorkeled a little bit swam a little bit that's where that ram's head hiking trail is there seemed to be a little bit more seaweed there and then a lot more seaweed in coral bay so we talked to a local guy who was at the beach this afternoon and he mentioned that that area tends to have a little bit more of the seaweed and um that sometimes it can be on this side of the island as well yeah. so that might be worth checking he said just, for a couple of weeks yeah for a couple of weeks and that it can be thick and um we just haven't experienced that in may when we've come so might be worth just checking in to see like 
when when could that be a possibility? And of course, that's just nature. And so, I mean, it's not anything that anybody can control. But on this side, you are probably less likely to have that than on the coral bay yeah. side. And unfortunately, when it does happen, it's not very pleasant. You definitely don't like to swim in it. When it gets on the beach, it smells bad. So we've been fortunate. So just, but something to be aware of because we would hate for you to come here and just there be seaweed everywhere. And it's like, okay, they didn't even talk about that. So yeah. just something to be aware of. Because so. I'm telling you right now, you could not find clear waters anywhere. 100% clear. So with every destination episode that we do, we ask Melissa to give us a list of the top things that you should put on your packing list. This one's more about beach and snorkeling gear than clothes because I think it's important to be prepared for that. Yes, absolutely. I feel like the last several days we've just kind of used the same things over and over again. And I will say our villa thankfully also had a washer and dryer. So you might want to look for that because it has been nice to wash um, a few of the things that we talk about. So definitely a bathing suit and cover up or something easy to put over um, your bathing suit to hike in, hike out, to go to the next beach as well. Um, so tropical clothing, you want shorts and tank tops and t-shirts. It's humid. We've had a little bit of rain, not too much, but things that would also dry quickly if you, um, laid them out. Um, you could bring something that was a little dressier. I wouldn't plan for a lot of that. Um, just because the restaurants are very casual. I mean, if you wanted to dress up a little bit, but, um, I, I wouldn't take up yeah. a lot of room in your suitcase for yeah, dressy. Clothes. Resort wear is perfectly fine at these restaurants. Yeah, so if you plan to snorkel and can fit it in, I would definitely plan to bring your own snorkel gear. Um, so we didn't mention this, but several of the beaches, the more popular ones um, or the busier ones, so like Trunk Bay and Cinnamon Bay and Maho Bay, had a few little like concession things open during the day, rentals, chair rentals, snorkel rentals, um, a few places to get food and beverages, um, not a lot, and I don't know that you could guarantee that they were open. So I would definitely recommend that you bring snorkel gear if that's that's your main plan, snorkel gear that you feel comfortable with and um, like. And then also a rash guard just to help protect you from, if you're snorkeling a lot, that sun and getting your back just completely blistered. Yeah. Um, and we'll put a link. Um, I have, I, I tested out a new full face um, snorkel mask this time. So you know, not just like a, a dive mask that has a snorkel tube that you put into your mouth. This is full face and it has a, a tube off to the side of it um, for the air. And that by far is the best snorkel mask I've ever used. And so um, highly recommend it. It's made by Seaview and we'll put that in the show notes, um, a link to it where you can where you can purchase one of those. And I just really feel like these full face snorkel masks, it just completely changes the game. There's no like getting used to the breathing. And I have TMJ in my jaws where I like clench my jaws. And if I use the, um, the one where you're having to like grip the mouthpiece, it, it's just, it's life changing. And yeah. we took them to the Galapagos. They didn't were like, Oh, why are y'all using those? Like, that's not real snorkel gear. Like, no, it was, um, and they, uh, they're fantastic. So yeah. We'll if you want to breathe through your nose, you breathe through your nose. If you want to breathe through your mouth, breathe through your mouth. Um, these are just absolute fantastic masks. I will say that I, I've heard that in colder water, the plastic in these face masks doesn't do as well, and it tends to fog up more. But here in the warmer waters, uh, no problem. And so um, also you're going to want to bring reef safe sunscreen. Um, there are signs posted, please use reef safe sunscreen. And you will see, I will say in these reefs here, you will see some of them are absolutely beautiful. And then some of them are definitely degrading. I mean, from weather and then just from pollution and lots of things from, but just so that we can do everything that we can and use reef safe sunscreen. Um, and I would say some um, reef safe like lip balm, sunscreen lip balm too. So your um, your lips don't just get completely burned. The sun here is very, very intense. Yeah. And so, you know, just a little tip as we're talking about sunscreen. Remember the back of your legs are going to get sun as you're floating on top of the water. So, you know, if you're a female wearing a bikini bottom or something like that, um, remember your hips down on the backs need to be um, protected from the sun 
uh, with, with, you know, sun, waterproof sunscreen or whatever. And then I'd also say, um, so I have, you know, short hair. And so if you have short or thin hair, uh, you might want to think about um, doing something to cover your head and the back of your neck as well. Because you can get burned very quickly and you don't even realize it. So even if, like Scott's mentioned, like your rash guard could um, ride up a little bit. And so then your the area of your back could still get burned. So just using the sunscreen for that. So, um, so we mentioned that we hiked to a couple of the snorkel places. So you definitely want um, sandals like Tevas. And it's the same Tevas that we keep mentioning because they are just fantastic. They can get wet and you can still walk in them. Um, so we're going to link those again. But um, so it's the same ones we took to the Galapagos. So the only pair of shoes I brought on this trip at all. So both to... Puerto Rico and here to St. John was those Tevas, and I wear them for every occasion. We also have been taking a small cooler back and forth to the beach. We debated about bringing this for the whole trip, and um, we actually found a really cool one at a little shop as we were waiting for the ferry in St. Thomas. It's called a Gecko Brand, um, and I'll see if I can find a link to it. But it's been a, a lifesaver. It holds, um, it could hold, like it looks like it could hold a couple of wine bottles. We've been putting like five or six water bottles in those. Um, and so just having a small cooler bag, um, you're going to want to take some drinks and snacks to the beach every day just because there's just not a lot of options. Definitely water. So good, good tip there is take a couple of water bottles, fill them up, put them in your freezer, um, freeze them overnight, and then use those as like ice packs inside your cooler. So I'm going to, um, packing list, I'm going to say plastic bags for wet gear. Um, and so you could bring those from home or you could get them at the grocery shop. Of course, at one of the grocery shops that we went to, I think the Starfish market, they didn't have bags. Like you had to purchase their bags. Um, so you might want to just bring along a few grocery bags. They're great to have. We've been throwing them in the cooler and then we can just toss in like the wet rash guards. Um, and then, the, a bag that you can carry to the beach. And so that could, again, be a reusable shopper bag, and you could just throw everything in there and take it to the beach with you. I've been using my my wet bag. It's the same bag that I took to the Galapagos, um, but you, you fold over the top and then click it together, um, and it makes it a waterproof bag. also does a good job in keeping the sand out of the bag as well, and so I would mm-hmm. recommend that. And you've been putting all your camera and it's gear a backpack. There, so. yeah. That's true. So we'll link that again as well. Um, and then the other thing that has been a lifesaver for us on these snorkel beach days have been these camping gym towels that are actually very thin. They almost remind me of like a uh, what's what do you call it when you like rub like a, like when a you, chamois like a chamois like when you do the car wash. Um, and the they dry very quickly so as we would go so we've been doing two or three beaches a day and by the time we would get to the next beach they would really be dry the sand doesn't stick to it if you take a regular beach towel it's just gonna like get wet and be full of sand and we love the sand cloud towels we use those at home I just felt like those were a little bit big I guess Mm -hmm. you could use the smaller ones but these are even smaller than that and have been great for just for packing Um, so we'll link those because they've been fantastic and they come in a little drawstring brag and then of course to GoPros, underwater cameras, if you are going to snorkel and want to take um, pictures of those, those have been great. And then I want to add another list if you're going to be having a villa and then be going shopping. Don't forget... Um, to buy things like Ziploc bags, unless you bring them from home, to pack those sandwiches in and to pack some snacks in as well. And then, of course, I mentioned the shopping bag, but just bring a shopping bag from home. You can take it to the store, then you can take it to the beach um, as well. We are really into snorkeling uh, while here at St. John, and that took up most of our days on this trip. As always, we invite you to share with us your own favorite places to stay, eat, and things to do in which we haven't covered. Drop us a note or leave a comment what you love the most about St. John. We love hearing from you and are inspired by your stories. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will find some inspiration for your next trip. Most importantly, follow our podcast, leave us a review, and share it with your friends to help them catch the travel bug. You never know, they may become your greatest travel companions.